right, the Reds, it's Talking Reds, and uh, today's guest on Talking Reds, we've got Tony Evans, uh, formerly the football editor of the Times, uh, still keeping his hand in, doing stuff for The Independent and the South China Morning Post, among others. Also, the author of what I regard as one of the best books I've read about Liverpool, Far Foreign Lands, uh, a great read. Uh, Tony's been pushing it again on his Twitter lately. Uh, it's a good time to read it because it's around the time it was written back in the day in terms of it being around the final, it being around Istanbul, and also just being around the, the journey of being a Liverpool fan. Obviously, that journey is sort of curtailed at the moment and we're all waiting for it all to start up again. But, Tony, we are sort of having a bit of fun at the moment as Reds remembering those good times. Everyone was sort of posting up the pictures of... Istanbul and stuff yesterday, uh, including myself. And um, you know, I, I'm not just saying that because you, you're on the call, mate. You know, I did, I, I did really enjoy this book. I mean, I, I remember Barrett as well, who obviously worked for you, uh, saying to me, you, you know, you'll you'll love this one, and he he won't give anyone any praise. You know what he's like. <laughs> so um, so he obviously loved it as well. Uh, just just tell us about the sort of the process around that book, where you got the idea from, and and then the book itself, please, mate. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, it was one of those things where you come back from Istanbul and it was, it was one of the most remarkable things any of us have ever seen. And, you know, and, and just a brilliant, a, a, you know, a brilliant event, the whole thing. And everyone wanted to know how quick it books, you know, it was approached by three or four people. And, um, but they kind of, they didn't want the sort of book I wanted to write. I wanted to write a book that, you know, wasn't just like, rah, rah, Liverpool are great, but one that like talked about, what was like being a fan and what Istanbul meant, you know, warts and all. I mean, because, you know, I'm at that older generation, you know, sort of, um, I was lucky, I was 16 in 1977, what a year to be 16. And, but, you know, so I saw all the, the, the majority of the glory years and especially Europe and all that. But, you know, it wasn't all just, you know, fun and having a great time like Istanbul. You know, there was some very, very ugly stuff that happened. Rome, Heisel. So I wanted to write a book. And most people who wanted me to do it, they didn't want this sort of stuff. They didn't want the reality of what it was like to be a football fan in those years. They just wanted to say, you know, I got on a train in Lime Street and I got off a train in Istanbul. Whoa, what a jolly old time. Well, it wasn't quite like that. So I wrote a book about football culture as far as I could see, is about what was what meant to be a Liverpool fan and why Istanbul matters and why, looking back, why it continues to matter. And I wrote it in the summer of 2005. So looking back, it's a, it's a work of history, but I think it's a snapshot of how many of us felt. And you look at how the game's changed since and you think, it's a wonder we still feel that way. <laughs> I mean, it, it is a sort of water all book as well, and it's only in that, you know, you said there it, it wasn't one that maybe some publishers wanted. But because of that, though, it's what you wanted to write. It's honest, and it's it's the stuff in there, you know, about Heysel and things like that, about politics, about the identity of people from Liverpool and things like that. And as I say, you know, it, I, I, for me, it's an important read, and it, it's a, it's something that any any Red should read. But seemingly a lot, a lot of Reds still haven't read it, and we, we were just saying before we started as well, because of the way in which you've published it and put it out there, um, you know, you can go on Amazon, for instance, at the moment, someone on there flogging it for 50 quid. Uh, but here you are on this call right now, and people can buy it from you, can't they, literally? Yeah, it's just 750, 750 UK, uh, £10 Europe, 12 50 rest of the world. I mean, yeah, it's. I, I, I did a, a reprint of it in 2007 because the, the first one sold out, uh, which was separate from the publisher who was involved. So, uh, so I've got a, a few boxes sitting there. So if anyone wants it, they know where to get it. But I mean, the, the, the things when, when the, the publisher who did it, uh, little things, not even Heisel or anything like that, or Hillsborough, which is also addressed in it. But like, it was. Like, she come back to me and she said that all this stuff she said about uh, Liverpool fans abroad and and you seem to be putting forward a moral justification for them stealing and I'm like yeah and she's going sure do you want to take out the book I'm like no and she's like <laughs> well, uh, you know the, the reality is our boys went on the rob when they went away and you know it's like well, why lie about it yeah exactly and you know that was that was the thing for me I think anyone who sort of Grown up, going to match, especially around this area. But you don't have to be from this area; you can be from anywhere and enjoy the book. You, you do get 
a real sense of an honest book. I mean, it, it is as well, you know, a time when, as I say before, celebrating Istanbul and all that kind of thing. And we all know what happened. Um, I've watched the match again the last couple of days and it, it still sort of blows me away. But, you know, you mentioned before how fortunate you were to, to live to literally when it all started. And, and you've seen, you know, seen every final and that kind of thing. What 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 are the what are the things that still jump out for you now around about this time of year in terms of golden moments being a red? I mean, obviously the twenty fifth of uh, the twenty fifth of May is always the biggest day in you know for us. You know, seventy seven winning it for the first time, and then you know then then Istanbul, you know, unbelievable. I mean that that jumps out. I mean, you know, the UEFA Cup final in Dortmund, what a day that was. Rome, the in in eighty four. Now that was a nightmare again, addressed in the book, and the consequences of that rumbled on into Heisel the next year, which obviously it, it, you 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 top you stop and you pause for thought every year this time of year because of Heisel, and you know sort of our contribution to what happened there, which you know was a. You know, we we can't we can't shy away from you know the, there's a whole causal chain of events, and you take any link out of that chain, and people don't die. But we were we were a big link in that chain, you know. So you can't deny that. Um, but it, most of the most of the time, I think at, at the great days. I mean, I think at Wembley in '86, you know, beating Everton to do the double a year after Heisel, and credit to the Evertonians, they deny it now. They don't even want to take praise off us. <laughs> But credit to the Evertonians for the way they acted that day and the the chance of Mersey sides. I think of that, and you know that. But most of all, I think about the ability. Like right? you, you could go almost up until Istanbul, you could go to a European final or even a cup final for the most part, and you could go without a ticket. And you know, you know, you get a ticket one way or another. You get one outside. You know, you. I, I was I was thinking about going to Dortmund in two thousand and one. We pitched up at the ground the morning of the game. And there was a queue for the box office. We went there and we got the best seats in the ground, like literally either side of the halfway line. That's like, you know, they were like 100, what well, would have been about 100 quid each. So they were expensive. But, you know, it was, you could do that. You can't do that anymore. You know, it, it's all changed after Istanbul. And, and, and that's why Istanbul is so important. I think it was the last of the old style finals. And there'll never be anything like that again. Athens was a nightmare. Yeah. You know, everyone had seen the, the, the party at Istanbul and everyone wanted to be part of it and turned up without tickets but turned angry when they couldn't get in um, and now, you know, I mean Kiev, Kiev was a bit better I mean most people who went to Kiev got in because just because it was almost on the edge of the football world but you know, you, for, for me the, the saddest thing and the, 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 I mean, not the saddest thing in finals because obviously highs are far worse but it was really sad last year to go to Madrid and see so many good Reds, so many people who, you know, go everywhere and just resign to watching it in bars, yeah. you know, having a great time, obviously. It was a great party, but it, it, it's really sad. And coming out the ground, there was, it seemed to me that there were, there were that was corporate, you know, the, the amount of corporate people was unbelievable. And you think... It, that's really sad. The the demand and and the desire to see these finals is unbelievable. And I'm very lucky because I can get in and get to see them. But you know, me mates went who you know who've been to all the other finals and I come out afterwards and they've been in a bar watching it. And you think something's gone wrong with football when so many people who go so regularly can't get into the grounds. And that is that's kind of the the depressing coda to Istanbul, really. You know, the, we, we, we've, Istanbul was part of a protest. I mean, just before, I mean, literally two weeks before Istanbul, the Glazers took control of Manchester United. Abramovich was already at Chelsea. You know, Istanbul led to Gillette and Hicks. The, the, the game was changing under mm. our feet and we didn't know it. And that's what makes Istanbul such a, a, a lovely memory. But we didn't know what was coming. And we've seen, you know, 14 years on in Madrid, we saw the consequences of the way the game's changing. And it hasn't changed for the better that way. You talk about changes, Tony, and obviously you've seen a lot and you've been part of, of documenting these changes, but also the changes in the way football is, is covered, is presented, is, you know, given in the media as well, really. I mean, you know, you'll remember as well as I do that, 
you know, it used to just be like a couple of pages at the back of the paper and the pink echo, one match a week on the telly, and that was about it. Um, now it's, you know, wall to wall, 24 hour, 24 7, even when there's nothing happening, you know, Sky Sports is still taking along and things like that. And, you know, you were footy editor at the times when they were producing the game pullout, which was, you know, again, a, a huge, when you think about the journey of football journalism, you know, that was a huge undertaking, really, from the times to be producing that much stuff about football every week. And, it, you know, and it was brilliant and we all lapped it up, but it was a big change. And I just wonder what you've made of the changes in the relationship between football and media, because obviously around the coronavirus now, there are concerns still from various parties, including some fans, et cetera, that it, it's being rushed back a little bit because of media, because of media contracts, because of TV money and things like that. And we've got news today about, you know, there's likely to be um, more matches shown three o'clock on a Saturday, possibly free to wear and all this kind of thing, but almost not played simultaneously to make sure as many people can watch and things like that. You know, that sounds quite good on one hand, but then you're thinking about contracts on the other, you're thinking about money. And it seems like we talk about contracts and money a lot more than we once did many, many years ago. And yeah, so, I mean, the short the short version of that question is, what, what do you think of that change in relationship between football and media? Oh, it's become a televisual game. It's no longer... I mean, w- when I was growing up, if you wanted to see the match, if you wanted to go to the match, the only way really to see live football, apart from cup final day and the odd international, was go to the match. So, but now, you know, people, and to use the word that the, the pop, you know, they, is popular with the market, and then people consume their football as a televisual game. And I don't think that's a bad thing in essence, but it's kind of, it's it's... It's a road to a certain extent, the culture of, of fandom, of going the match, you know, and, um, and, and too many people have taken it for granted. One of the, the only, very few good things have come out of this coronavirus issue, but one of the good things is that people will see that football without fans is, is nowhere near as, as, as great an experience. I'll be honest with you, you know what? Football, if for the most part, it's crap. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> what 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 is great about it is going to the match with your mates, having a few bevies. I have to watch it sober because it's work. You know what? A lot of the time, it's rubbish. You know, it's uh, <laughs> as a form of entertainment. It's not brilliant. What makes it worthwhile is the fact that you're with like-minded people. You're having a laugh. You meet them before. You meet them after. I mean, it's difficult now because you, you know you where you're sitting at the ground. You know, you can be spread out from all your mates, so yeah. it's not as good as it used to be. But Obviously, I'm exaggerating. Football is not crap. For long periods of games, it is. You know, there's, unless, you know, you're watching the Aaron Klopp sides and then, you know, then it's a bit lively all the time. But you know what I mean? It, 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 there are flat periods in it. Yeah. And it's kind of, you know, and, and you see that because it's become te- such a televisual game. You see the people who are obsessed with, like, you know, uh, Acts of skill, you know, and uh, you see, uh, I see a lot of these compilation films where they've got, you know, it's a player and he's flicking the ball overhead. You don't see the end results at the match. When you go to the match, all you want is the end result. You want the goal. You know, acts of skill, they're for the telly, really. Goals are for the fans. Goals are for being in the match. So it's changed like that. I mean, did I have some part in changing the culture of it? Without a doubt, you know, we we probably, looking back on it, we, we did media overkill at the times. I mean, I remember we did the uh, on one of the most depressing nights in my work and life, um, the Moscow final between Man United and Chelsea. I think we did nine pages of it. Nine pages, you know, and it was like, including a huge graphic where we prepared one for each team if they won. And I, I tell you what, you know, when Man United have won for the third time and you've got to produce nine pages... I, it's a it's a bad night, honestly. <laughs> you know, I, I should have resigned there and then. But 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 yeah. But I mean, we 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 contributed to the media overkill. But then again, all you can say is that there is an appetite because it's become a television game. It's jumped football jumped out of its core audience somewhere between somewhere between somewhere in the nineties. But I think probably the real jump came in the 2000s. It jumped away from its core audience and brought a different sort of person to, to the game. I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I think there's many people who watch the game should, you know, the, and, and but it, it's it, it, it's it's changed and, and it's interesting now because we, we're on the cusp of another change and mm. which direction will it go. Sadly, 
I think it will become even more money oriented and uh, it will get further away from the the people, the traditional fan base. But, you know, things do change and, and thankfully by the time it gets too far away, I'll be dead. <laughs> well, on, on the actual uh, footy, Tony, as well, just to, to finish up, uh, you mentioned that we mentioned all the way through that all the fantastic Liverpool sides that you've seen, uh, all the brilliant moments in finals and things like that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you do this as well. You just have to remind yourself sometimes. I watched a, a compilation of Ian Rush the other day, and I was it blew me away. I mean, I've seen a lot of those goals at the time, but when you remind yourself of how good he was, you were just like, my God. But where, where, where would you put? the team that we're seeing now, the team that is on hold, press the pause button and all the rest of it, but the team that we expect to get those two wins eventually somehow and finally win number 19. Where do you put them in terms of teams you've watched, Tony? I've got to be right near the top. I, I would say um, the 78-79 team, uh, with, with you know, the, the brilliant midfield, you know, McDermott, Sunes, um, Jimmy Case and Ray Kennedy, uh, they, they were brilliant, but they were more efficient. So they, they, they didn't have as much flair. You know, you, you probably... I, I expect they beat this team, but they would be... It would be uh, because of the dark arts, you know, a bit like Ramos in, in Kiev, they would. But I'd, I'd rather watch this team than them, even though, you know, Dalglish and Sunes played for them. The Barnes-Beardsley team, you know, when they when they were on form, when they were rampant, you know, everyone forgets like players like Steve Nichol, who was just magnificent. You know, it's a, people talk about Maldini. Nichol was better than Maldini. It's um, you know, they 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 were a magnificent team. They a, a match between Klopp side and them would be one hell of a game, and I don't know who would win that one. I suspect as Burns because Burns was probably the best player in the world at that time. You know, so to, well, no, Maradona was the best player in the world, but when when he dipped off a bit. You know, he, he was there and thereabouts. So that would be real close. But I'd say there's, there's my top three. And I don't even want to rank them in order. I mean, it, it, this this side's going to win a title. They'll probably win a title next year, assuming that we have a, a, a season, which, of course, we will. Um, and, you know, another another European Cup slash Champions League would be good. But they're up there with the best. And to watch them, they're just, you know, it's the, the breathtaking, aren't they? You know, it's... Yeah. Um, and I, I just think yeah, Klopp's done a magnificent job. Uh, it, you know, I, my view of him when he came in, people thought I didn't like him. But my view was, you earn your place in the pantheon of great managers. And my feeling was that a lot of people put him there early, like they put Brendan Rodgers in, and look how that turns out. So be cautious, wait till he wins stuff. Not only has he won stuff, but he's won it in style. And he has the sort of personality who... Where it, where it chimes in with our football culture, the way we think, yeah. the way we wanna, the way we wanna behave, the way we wanna be, you know, the the, the way we wanna self-identify, and and Klopp fits in perfectly with that. And I think um, so. Uh, yeah, in the in the top three, and um, uh, you know, and another, as I say, another two titles, another couple of more Champions League, you know, chase down Real Madrid, and then they'll be top. Good one. Uh, okay, well, on the book, so only just to finish up then, remind people uh, where they can get it, how they get hold of you, how they get a copy of it. Uh, uh, the best, the easiest way is going to Twitter, Tony Evans, 92A, um, and there's a link there. I mean, you probably won't like my opinions. You know, people don't. It's, um, but you and, and, you know, you probably, especially if you're one of those people who are sympathetic to the Tory government, you won't like me on that either. And I'll often tell you things you don't want to hear. But you know what? That's me roll. <laughs> it's right, Tony. Thanks for coming on Talk on Reds today. Do check out Tony's book. It is a brilliant read and it's a brilliant time to read it. Everyone's got a little bit of time on their hands at the moment. The sunshine and get out there, buy Tony's book, read the book in the park. Keep your distance though and all that. Eh? Yeah. Um, stay safe. Stay safe. Don't be like Dominic Cummins. It's right. Uh, that has been Talk and Reds. Thanks, Tony. Always a pleasure, Rubble.